Montpelier High School's um, teacher and also, I believe, a huge part of the center for sustainable yeah. system. So, welcome. Thank you, Jody. Welcome to the Garage Cultural Center, certainly. <coughs> Montpelier High School's teacher. Yeah. <laughs> 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 There's a bunch of us. I, I am one. I'm a science teacher at the high school. I'm also the director of the Center for Sustainable Systems. I know a bunch of you probably are like, what's that? I've never heard of that. Well, the CSS is an educational nonprofit based out of the high school, which has enabled us to do a lot of the sustainability work that we do there, including a lot of the work around food systems. So if you've been behind Montpelier High School along the bike path and you've seen the greenhouses and the gardens and the chicken coops and the pizza oven and all that, that in part is the work of the CSS. It also funds a uh, summer program called Food Farm Society where students get credit and they get paid for their work. We have an alumnus here, Erin Kelly, who did some fantastic work with bees this summer. We're excited about that. Um, we also have Grace Valentine, a Montpelier High School student who's doing an independent study on pollinators and has been working with, with Leaf, one of our panelists, building mason bee houses and doing a bunch of cool work and help, helping organizing these events. So I want to thank Grace as well. Thanks. Awesome. So the layout for the night is I'm going to have the panelists who are just incre incredibly impressive panel right here, certainly. I'm going to have them introduce themselves, and I have just a few questions that I'm going to ask them to make sure we kind of cover the, the foundation of um, you know, the, the topic here and their work, and then open it up for questions from the audience. Before we get to that, though, <clears throat> excuse me, I just want um, for them and myself to get a sense of this room here. So um, if you could, if you uh, keep bees, have kept bees, Raise your hand, please. <clears throat> okay, make sense of that. We're taking notes over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's not registered? <laughs> if you have or currently do it professionally, commercially, raise your hand, please. <laughs> now it's not raising his hand. Now he knows it. I'm considered a sideliner. You're a sideliner yeah, now? Under 150, I think, is a sideliner, right? Uh, I say under 300, 50 to 300 is considered sideliner. Yeah, and From, yeah. So okay, just, if you're a sideliner, <laughs> <laughs> I'm under a thousand. That's good. That's good. Um, if you, let's see, if you have been involved in um, advocacy work around bees, maybe the, the recent legislation. All right, we have some folks. I'm sure we'll get to that tonight as well. Awesome. All right, so let's just. Okay, moving here with the introductions. I want to just briefly go through name, job title, kind of what puts you on this panel, and then we'll come back around and we'll do some questions. Great. Um, do I go first? <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Brooke Decker, and I am the new state bee inspector. And the job is actually combined with a position that was created um, through the Act 35, which I think a lot of you know as H205, the Pollinator Health Specialist. So it's a combined job that I get to work on pollinator stuff all the time. So full-time year-round position. Um, how I got here. The road to success is often <laughs> long and winding. No. Um, I've had a um, love for bees my whole life. We, I grew up keeping bees with my mom. Um, we um, always had bees. I got addicted to honey, so then as an adult, I wanted to keep bees myself. And I've been keeping bees myself for about 12, 12 years or so, and I have about 20 colonies that I manage. Um, for pollination on an organic farm and also for some honey. Um, I also have a master's degree in environmental science from Antioch University. And uh, prior to my job working with the state, I um, did kind of what Tom was talking about, sustainable farming education work at a nonprofit um, at Hildean in Manchester, Vermont. So, we, um, it was a really unique program. The local high school would come and we would do educational farming program, but we really felt everything that we uh, worked on was what would the pollinator, you know, what could we do to help promote pollinators? So it was very pollinator heavy. So we did a lot of education around pollinators, a lot of habitat building for pollinators. 
and um, manage the honeybees there. Um, we definitely managed the grounds uh, through IPM and integrated pest management. We didn't use pesticides, um, so pollinators were big on um, that um, location. And then for three summers, I worked with David, who's here. He's the old bee inspector. I was, was his part-time <laughs> summer assistant. So it was an easy fit when he retired. I um, applied for the position. And yeah, so that's how, that's my kind of quick background. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Lee Richardson. Um, I am a uh, bee researcher and I focus for the most part on uh, bees other than honeybees, on wild or native bees. Um, I've been at it for quite a while. Uh, I've um, had also had a winding path to, to where I am. I've worked in government, I've worked in academia, and now I work for a business, um, all doing science. So uh, I have a PhD in ecology and evolution, um, which I'm from Dartmouth about five years ago. Um, my research um, at that time, and still continues to be, um, is aimed at looking at the interaction between plants and bees, at pollination interactions, and what kinds of traits of the bees and traits of the plants mediate that interaction. So things like the, sh the sugar content of nectar, the chemistry of pollen, um, the disease status of the bees themselves. All of these things um, interact to uh, affect outcomes of, of, of a floral uh, interaction that might result in pollination of the flower, or it might not result in pollination of the flower. It results in a meal for the bee, but is it a good meal or a less good meal? Right? And so particularly, I was working on the chemical ecology of pollination and I think um, I, I have a note. We're going to talk about this a little bit more later, so I'll skip the details there. Um, I did a postdoc at UVM after that for two years, two and a half years, uh, which was focused on the agricultural pollination of, by wild bees in Vermont. So we were studying highbush blueberry on farms, mostly in the Champlain Valley, but also some over here, uh, and looking at the way that um, uh, Highbush blueberry is impacted positively by below ground mutualist fungi, right? Like mycorrhizal fungi that associate with the roots and help the plants acquire nutrients. Um, and then they're also helped by bees that pollinate the flowers and increase the yield of the of the crop on these farms. But what we found is there's an interaction between the two the two partners. So the bees the, the plants do best when they have both the fungi and the bees. And I can talk more about that later. Now I work for Stone Environmental, which is right across uh, town. And I do a whole array of different projects related to bees and agriculture. So I do um, inventories of bumblebees. Um, I look for the endangered uh, rusty patch bumblebee, places like uh, Cape Cod this summer, uh, West Virginia and Virginia this past summer, um, uh, Maine, Northwestern Vermont. Um, so we just, we go out, we net bees, in the case of bumblebees, we identify them and then we release them. So there's no killing involved, so we get a lot of data. Uh, or there's very minimal, um, actually, sampling. Um, I do, there's a great project uh, that I want to plug at some point. It's called Bees of Vermont. That is run by the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. We just started it this year. It's a citizen science project to inventory all the different types of bees in the state. We have about, we think about 325 different species of bees just here in Vermont. Yeah. We think that. I used to say that we have 275 species when we started this project, and this guy that we work with, as part of the project, is very good at, at, at identifying bees, and he keeps finding new ones. And so mm -hmm. the idea is we don't actually know what we have here. We don't know what we've lost. We don't know what we stand to lose. So the idea is to inventory the bees now, and then we can check again in 10 years or 20 years and, and see how they're doing. Um, and I do a lot of pesticide research at, at uh, Stone Environmental. So this involves um, looking at data, um, risks to bees, and thinking about ways to mitigate those risks. It also involves a lot of field science, so actually going to the field, setting up an experiment, making a pesticide application, letting it drift downwind, collecting the, the particles that we didn't want to see drift downwind, and quantifying how far the thing moves and what the risk is to bees, so that's as an example. Um, so, uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Come back to that. Yeah. You know, I've been using that 275 number, and you never told me about it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going to hold questions. Right? We have plenty of time for questions, but we do want to kind of move through this. Yeah. 
I'm Samantha Alger. Um, so I'm from Rhode Island originally. I graduated in 2009 with an undergraduate degree in business and biology. And um, it was difficult to find a job at that time, so I did a lot of different things. I went to Hawaii to learn a little bit about farming, and that's when I started beekeeping and got an interest in, um, in pollinator conservation and decided it was time to go back to grad school. So I went to moved to Vermont in 2013 and um, started a PhD program there in the biology department. And there I studied disease in wild pollinators and in honeybees. Um, and so I finished my PhD last year and since then have um, started working as a, a, re as a research professor um, in the plant soil science department at UVM. I'm still working on pollinator research there. Um, we got a specialty crop block grant to start the bee lab at, at UVM and we're going to be um, testing samples of bees that come in from either beekeepers like yourselves or from the Agency of Agriculture for different pests and pathogens because currently beekeepers can or the Agency of Ag can send samples to um, the federal lab but this is um, you know can have issues due to staffing shortages or federal shutdowns we saw at one point. Um, and so they we're trying to create like a local place where beekeepers can send samples in to get um, this testing done. Um, I also teach beekeeping at, at UVM. We started teach, I, teach, I started teaching that last summer. Um, and um, I'm on the board of the Vermont Beekeepers Association and I run the National Honey Bee Survey here in Vermont. Um, so it's a nationwide effort to gather baseline data on bee disease. And so we collect samples of, from Vermont beekeepers and send them to this lab in Maryland to get tested for pathogens and also pesticide analysis. So I've been doing that for the past five years now. So we have some of the first standardized data on bee disease and, um, and pesticide data um, for the state of Vermont through this um, Farm Bill funded program, the National Honey Bee Survey. Um, and so that's, so I've got my one foot in research and that's at UVM and then my other job, which is I work about 30 hours a week as a consultant at this company called DHB. Um, it's a, it's a engineering architecture firm, um, consulting firm down in South Burlington. And you wonder how someone with a pollinator background or biology background ends up working at an engineering firm. Well, um, they were convinced that there was enough momentum behind pollinator protection efforts to hire somebody with my area of expertise. And so um, some of the biggest clients that we have are uh, like VTrans, for example, and Green Mountain Power. And so I've since working at VHB starting in March, um, we've been working with these groups and trying to figure out ways to improve pollinator habitat in a big way along um, uh, roadsides and maybe under um, also under utility corridors and things like that. So I've sort of got one foot in the academic world and another in um, the consulting business world, I guess. You guys are all doing good work. <laughs> Glad to be here. I think we have four bee inspectors in the room now. Could you put up your hand if you were once for a Vermont bee inspector? You were too? Oh, nice. Rick, oh, Rick followed me. All right. <laughs> I was actually Steve the very first full time agriculturist. All right. Yeah. Excellent. And he, wow. he create, didn't you create that job? Did you get a grant or something for that? Um, I was brought in, I was in the Finger Lakes of New York State after ag school, working with the elders, and um, the Department of Agriculture did something very quietly. They, they paid for my training in western New York, so I could come here and be the bee inspector for three years. There was a tremendous wave of American fowl brood coming into Vermont from New York State. Mm -hmm. And you know, we think about computers now and everything, but it was very radical at that time. I got these big yellow index cards, <laughs> and each beekeeper had their map on it and number of colonies and all that. And <laughs> we mapped everything pretty carefully. Yeah. That was great. I love I love my time as a bee inspector in northern Vermont, northern nine counties back in the late seventies and early eighties. It was really wonderful. Excellent. Um, I started with my brother Tommy when he was nine and I was 12 with a beehive on our family farm. And I was just enchanted by the bees and really have been with them all my life. Um, after the work in New York State for the um, beekeepers in the Finger Lakes, I came to Vermont 40 some years ago. And um, 
eventually was running a couple thousand beehives in 63 locations in the Champlain Valley of Vermont and the St. Lawrence River Valley of Northern New York. It was a tremendous experience. 1900 hives. It was a complete um, roller coaster, you know, coming into the spring from the winter and die off. And the early years we made incredible crops, 120, 140 pound averages. And then they just kept declining as the mites came more onto the scene. And um, I saw this tremendous loss. It was very depressing, but we kept going for years, but we continually added more value-added products. Um, wild cherry cough syrup with raw honey. Um, I, th I think I helped bring back raw honey to the country. It had taken 60 years off. Um, certainly New York beekeepers all made fun of me when I went and bought raw honey because we didn't have enough in Vermont to make wild cherry cough syrup, elderberry syrup. Um, we're still buying honey from them at Bar Hill down the road here. Um, long, long relationships and um, now they understand how important raw honey is. But we make propolis spray, um, salve. I brought a lot of the products and they're in the back or on the side if you'd like to take a look at them. Um, there's honey from New Zealand and sweet um, <coughs> Spain. I've consulted in these areas and picked up jars of honey. Um, and eventually we started adding honey to gin, making bar of gin, and making bar of vodka from scratch with honey. And I turned that company over to the team four and quarter years ago, and now farm grain and elderberries and raised bees in Greensboro, Thornhill Park. Still very much connected to the bees. Um, it's become a, a very rich area for honeybees. We have 100 acres of grain, all with an understory of two or three lagoons. So now we have 100 acres, so it's really a paradise for bees as we plant a cover crop as an understory to the winter rye that we grow for Calvin spirits. And um, we made some a good crop of honey this year, which is really exciting. And probably the most wonderful thing that happened to me this summer is another person came. I do bee venom therapy, and everyone I've worked with has gotten over their Lyme disease. And I just so respectful of the bees and their healing power, not only in the raw honey, propolis, and the pollen, which has really been my life, but the venom. Um, everyone that um, has come for bee venom therapy has gotten over their lives to bees. It's really, really important. And I wish there was more work being done on that. But um, those who want to can come to people all over the world and get bee venom therapy. The bees are very generous with what they do. And it's really exciting to continue to be a part of bee venom therapy and the raw honey and now working as a uh, very part-time person for Caledonia Spirits and also growing great for them. So that's all. Uh, I'm Mr. Mayor, first question. So first of all, Todd, thank you for borrowing the gym personally. It's just a <laughs> Two researchers here with current, um, you know, the most recent data out there. But while you're on a roll here, aside from varroa mites, I mean, you've been keeping bees for 50 years. How else has it changed? For better, for worse, what are those factors that are influencing that? Well, the other part of the story is my two beehives died. I can't keep them alive. Um, in the bucket list of this part of my life, that's the goal, to keep the bees alive. Um, I, I used um, strips when they first came out, the chemical strips, and they give the bees a little boost, and the, then they die. Uh, that was, you know, 30 years ago, and I, I've been organic ever since, and 
I kind of notched it up this year. I used um, formic acid, which is considered organic, and that didn't work. Um, that was a great sadness to me. You know, I'm going to um, get two nukes next spring from Josh White. It was really a pleasure to visit him for the first time. Three months ago, I went to a five frame nuke for uh, observation high for calorie years. Um, really impressed with what he's doing. You know, he's had to shift from organic to chemical just to keep going. And I respect that. Um, so the change has been um, where we used to have a 10, 50 percent winter loss. For me, it's been 100 percent. And I, um, I guess I'm really sad about that. And um, I hope I can have 20 hives someday. The critical mass to raise queen bees from survivors. For years, I would you know raise queen bees from survivors, and they get stronger and stronger. The queens, but then when they all die, you wiped out your years of research. So um, that's been a major change. And that's why we went into value-added products. Because um, wanting to continue to work with 300 beehives instead of 1,900, because we couldn't keep them alive. And we would, we would trade 100, 200 beehives and get honey back. Because I saw the writing on the wall. It's a tough business. It took 27 years to break even as a commercial beekeeper. And that was the year we had elderberry honey syrup, the year of the swine flu. Elderberries and antiviral agent. And um, so to see that continual decline with your life work, pretty depressing. But I'm not giving up. Did I answer all your questions? Yeah. I'm sure the crowd's going to have plenty of questions. Speaking of colony losses, come over to Brooke. Uh, from the Apiary Inspectors of America webpage. Quote, honeybee colony losses have steadily increased over the past decade from an average of 26% loss in 2006 to 44% in 2017. Is this consistent with what we're seeing in Vermont? I would say it is. Um, we were talking about this earlier. Those numbers are hard to quantify for many different reasons that I won't bore you with right now unless you really want to dive into it. Um, Thirty percent is the number I kind of find is um, I don't know it, it hovers around thirty percent. So yeah, that, and, and Rick and I were talking about this too earlier. That's what a lot of uh, sideliner commercial sized beekeepers find that they're losing year after year now. So that's pretty consistent. Yeah, and it's sad. So if you have two. It will be a hundred percent loss. So that's what, like the numbers are hard. If you you know if you lose all your colonies, that's a hundred percent. And how does that factor if you're a commercial beekeeper and you lose thirty? So yeah, that's where those numbers get confusing. But there are a lot of winter losses, and winter time is the time in Vermont that we see most of the losses. Yeah. So it's, it's not having reserves for the, the cold? Or it's not, it's cold? not that. It usually has to do with the varroa mites. So um, I could talk about that a little bit. So honeybees have a parasite called a varroa mite, and it's a, it's a, it, it, it would be like us having a tick the size of a small dog on our backs, and it feeds on um, fat bodies, which controls a lot of the functions in the bee, so it, it's depleting their kind of immune system, I guess. Is that the right, would it be the immune system? <laughs> Just the scientists here. <laughs> I see the results where they, um, it, so their, their immune systems are compromised, but then just like the tick with us, the viruses are spreading, they're transmitting viruses to the honeybees. So in the summer, they're able to um, well, we're, treat, we're, we're able to treat in the summer, I guess, and monitor the mite loads, but in the winter when the bees become dormant, um, they just, for, for a variety of different reasons, aren't able to make it through the winter. And it's usually mite related. Sometimes it's lack of honey, but generally if you see a colony that in the spring you open it up, there's tons of honey and no bees left, they're just dead on the bottom. It's obviously, it wasn't that they ran out of honey, it's that they had some disease from the mites. So Samantha, this, this brings us perfectly to you. Some the viruses, of your, yeah. <laughs> so some of your research um, looks at disease spillover mm -hmm. among wild and managed pollinators. Mm -hmm. um, you published this work. You've been on, on BPR speaking about it. C 
Could you explain uh, the direction and intensity of disease transmission among pollinators? Sure. Yeah, so there's been a, a lot of other previous work looking at just different kinds of diseases spilling over between managed bees and honeybees. Um, and my work specifically focused on the viruses that Brooke was just referencing. Um, so we know that these varroa mites um, vector viruses, so they'll transmit the viruses um, to honeybees. Um, and so the mites are really twofold. They're eating the fat bodies of the bee, and they're also transmitting these viruses, are threefold, and they're, they're affecting the immune system of the honeybees. But um, these viruses were detected, so when I, when I started my PhD in 2013, we, we, there were a couple papers that started detecting these viruses in other bees besides honeybees. And so the question was, how are these viruses getting transmitted to bees besides honeybees? Because the varroa mites don't vector other bees. They're just they're specific to honeybees. So how are these viruses getting around? Um, and so in my in my PhD work, we I went out and sampled bumblebees throughout um, Vermont and looked to see if I can find these viruses in bumblebees. And in fact, I could. And one of the viruses, black queen cell virus, there was 75% of the bumblebees had this virus. Deformed wing virus, which is like the telltale of the varroa mite and honeybees. Um, we found that in about 12% of bumblebees here in Vermont. But we also found that bumblebees that were living near honeybee apiaries were way more likely to have these viruses. Um, and so it suggests that these viruses could be, could be coming from honeybees into wild bumblebees. Um, but we also asked, well, how are they getting transferred? Like, it's, if it's not the mite, how is this happening? And we tested flowers, because we thought this could be a place where bees can commingle on flowers. When they're on flowers, they leave behind salivary secretions or feces when they're foraging. Just like the flu, you know, when you're sick during the flu season, maybe a doorknob can serve as that, you know, as that place that you might get sick. Think of that as being we, we can we use the door dirty doorknob as an analogy of flowers out in the environment. Um, and so we tested a lot of flowers both inside or near honeybee apiaries. So an apiary, for those of you who aren't beekeepers, are just is just a place where bees are honeybees are kept. We test flowers um, in honeybee apiaries or near honeybee apiaries, and flowers where there wasn't any apiary within uh, at least a mile or so uh, or more. And we only found bee viruses on flowers near honeybee apiaries. All the flowers that we tested outside of honeybee apiaries were negative for the viruses. So this showed that, that this could be happening through flowers, and it appears that the honey, where the honeybees are located are, are um, hot spots for where these viruses could be coming from. Um, and that sort of propelled my, my next um, work, which was how can we reduce, lessen the risk of disease spillover from honeybees to bumblebees, because um, we're not going to eradicate the viruses, but if we have good beekeeping practices that keep varroa mites low in honeybees, that might keep viruses lower in honeybees and hopefully reduce the chances of the spillover from honeybees to bumblebees. Um, and so that's part of what this whole Vermont Bee Lab process has been to try to work with beekeepers in the, in the agency of ag to kind of help with, with the disease in, in honeybees. So Leif, there's, there's two angles I want to ask you about. Um, first though, we're talking about bumblebee loss. Can you just sum that up for us? What's the severity sure. of that? Uh, so, um, I'll talk about a project that the Vermont Center for Eco Studies did um, in 2012 through 2014, and I worked with them on this. It was a citizen science bumblebee inventory. So we had, I, descri I just described this, this all bee species inventory where we have volunteers collecting samples of all 325, I think I said, <laughs> species. This was just the bumblebees. There are, there were 17 species of bumblebees native to Vermont, as far as we can tell. We found specimens of 17 different species that were collected in Vermont over the last 120 years or so. Um, we have about, I don't know, 6,000 total specimens of bumblebees that go back through that century. So this is how we know about the past. And it's honestly, it's not very great um, data. It, it's, a, it's a point here and a point there. It's a, a UVM undergrad taking an entomology course who collected a hymenopteran, which turned out to be a bumblebee, and somebody put it on a pin and it went into this collection at UVM, and we're lucky enough to have that datum, right? But we need a lot of information to understand the diversity and the abundance and what we have now versus then. Um, so anyway, we did compare that historical data to um, about uh, 12,000 specimens collected by those volunteers um, in 2012, 2013, and a little bit in 2014. 
And so uh, the news is not particularly good for Vermont's bumblebees. We've got, uh, we, as I said, we had 17 species historically. We now can find 12 of those, and reliably we can only find nine or 10 of those. Um, uh, this work resulted in the listing of two of them as endangered at the state level, one of them uh, as threatened at the state level. There's a fourth that is petitioned right now to, to be listed as, as uh, endangered in Vermont. It's not endangered worldwide, but it is, uh, it is gone from Vermont, and it used to be abundant in the Champlain Valley in the 1960s. What's the name of it again? Uh, well, uh, it's called the American bumblebee. That's a common name for it. Um, Bombus That's sad. Yeah. So, so we had 17 species. We've actually lost those others. They're not extinct everywhere. They're, they still occur in different places. Um, so it's important to understand the difference between you know, local extinction and full extinction. Um, we think that these uh, declines are probably being driven by um, a combination of factors. So there's good evidence that bumblebees um, are negatively affected by the following four things. Um, these are umbrella stressor groups, but um, climate change is one of them. Uh, pathogens, including the ones that these guys have been talking about, um, but also some others that are specific to bumblebees. They're parasites, they're pathogens that um, live their whole life inside the body of a, of a bumblebee and jump to the next host like that. So it's not just a disease that human beings you know, accidentally introduced or something through mismanagement of something in agriculture. These are native, these are animals that occur here, belong here, alongside bumblebees, and some of them have changed somehow and are now driving declines. Um, so climate change, pathogens, uh, pesticides, and there's a lot to talk about there. Um, and then um, land cover change, so loss of habitat, uh, loss of floral habitat, loss of the, an abundance of the right types of plants. Um, in the case of bumblebees, they're, they're generalists. They're not quite as generalized as honeybees. Um, a typical bee is very unlike a bumblebee or a honeybee. A typical bee is solitary, so the, the mom, uh, she, after mating with a male, she goes and excavates a tunnel underground, lays something like five to ten eggs, um, provisions each one with its own little ball of pollen and nectar, closes them up like it's a, an Egyptian tomb from oh, wow. you know, <laughs> 3,000 so it's, years it's ago. So it's an actual outside chamber as opposed to like the, the other haploid, diploid methods that are like in different realms. It's, a, it's not a social insect, it's, it's solitary. And so that's the typical. It's just like a, a chain. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, uh, so, but a lot of those guys have just one floral host. They need pollen from sunflowers, sunflowers only, or squash plants, and they can only get pollen from squash plants. So, they're, if you don't grow squash next year, and you have that bee in your garden, it has to go somewhere else. It cannot survive without your squash plants. But bumblebees are like honeybees. They can eat hundreds, they can eat thousands of different things. And the point I'm long-windedly trying to get to here is that it's not, it's not specifically a loss of native plants, it's a loss of plants. So bumblebees do great, just as honeybees do, with a lot of um, non-native, really vexing weeds. Um, they produce great food for bees, right? So, um, so it's, it's a loss of habitat, um, but not necessarily a native plant species. Those, but also some, some of the others. Um, so, so there's much more to say about bumblebee losses in, in Vermont, but the only other thing I'll say about it for now is uh, Vermont's not unique, right? We, we see parallel declines in adjacent states and provinces um, in other parts of the country. And so the story is, is really, it's, it's a bigger one. It's about the whole, it's a continent scale problem. Indeed, it's a global problem. Some of these, these that have declined or disappeared here are related, closely related to others from Siberia, from uh, Tibet, and that, that are also in trouble. And so there's a taxonomic similarity, and then there, there are pathogen problems I mentioned. There's a possibility that we're looking at um, you know, differential susceptibility to disease with certain groups of bumblebees. Yeah. Okay. Can, for, um can you explain to folks who, who may not have considered bees other than a honeybee why this is such a problem? What's mm -hmm. the big concern about losing something like a bumblebee so rapidly? Yeah, so I'm gonna preface this by saying I love honeybees. 
But now you're going to hear me say some negative things about honeybees. <laughs> but I mean it. I really do. I think honeybees are amazing. I catch honeybees. Honey. Um, but let's be honest. We're talking about a farm animal. And we're, we're here talking about bees in general. So we're talking about one farm animal and 20,000 wild animals. And we're putting them all in the same box. There are about 20,000 species of bees worldwide. And only a few of them have, are farmed. Maybe 20 or 50 or something at most, right? There are very few honeybee species in the world, and this particular one, Apis mellifera, is, is, is unique. It's, it's very special. There are other species of, of honeybees in the whole world that are also farmed for honey. Um, but to answer your question, um, honeybees are important pollinators, but, uh, in, especially on farms, um, but so are these other bees. And research is starting to show us that in some cases, it's the wild bees that are doing the majority of the actual work on farms, uh, aside from the people uh, <laughs> pollinating the flowers. So, you, so the example of, of uh, highbush blueberry in the Champlain Valley, um, lots of the growers that we work with, they spend money to get uh, to rent hives, right? And I don't know what the cost for hive rental is, but it's a it's a couple hundred dollars a piece, right? Over a hundred. Uh, well, it depends on the crop, but almonds. Almonds, yeah, you're getting it like $200, but uh, pumpkins, I think it's like 50, and apples are maybe 80, so 50 to 80, like in state, I would say. So as a grower of blueberries in Vermont, this is a business expense. You just have to, you just have to do it. But uh, research at UVM by some of our colleagues is showing that for this particular crop, um, beekeepers know that blueberry is a little challenging for honeybees anyway. But what we're finding is that honeybees are not contributing very much to the success of the, of the farming operation at all. It's um, almost 100 different native species of bees that are commuting from the woods to the farm, feeding on the flowers, and then going back into the woods, or the field edge, or wherever it is that they're nesting. And not all of those are great pollinators, but a solid five to 10 species are doing almost all of the work. And they're all native species, and none of them are being tracked or monitored. Um, growers are completely unaware that these guys have habitat needs that extend beyond the, the flower itself, right? Not because, I'm not saying anything negative about blueberry growers, but we just don't think about those externalities to, to growing our food. And so, in addition to doing better with honeybees and helping honeybees with the problems that they have, um, it's really important that we realize the, that we are losing the ecosystem service of pollination and for the most part, we're not even aware of what we're losing because um, the research is just taking place in these little pockets. So um, that, that's the importance of losing bumblebees, which are actually really fantastic pollinators of, of a lot of crops and wild plants. Yeah. Well, I have one more question that I think will then segue into the larger Q&A. When well, we're looking at what, what can be done to protect pollinators, um, you mentioned habitat loss is a threat. So that's something that can be focused on. Climate change, we're going to leave that one there for now. <laughs> Cultural practices to reduce mites. We have programs in place where you can become a better beekeeper. Um, then we get to pesticides. Right? So uh, we had the, the, the pollinator protection bill, H205, which is now law, addressing that. I know there's folks in this room with a lot of experience and opinions on that. I'm sure that'll be part of the discussion. But just to the, the whole panel here, um, what about that law gives us reason to celebrate, and where maybe is there more work that needs to be done? We can celebrate that we have book. Yes, definitely. Game for you. I know what's right. I celebrate that too. <laughs> uh, I can say something about it. I guess. Um, so yeah, definitely celebrating Brooke's existence in this position, um, in that it is uh, a first step towards um, taking action on the things that the Pollinator Protection Committee put together. They put together, so the belief is on that committee. Um, no. That's it. No. <laughs> Surprise. Um, but they got together for a better part of a year and wrote this report that laid out recommendations for improving pollinator health. And so H205, I thought, was sort of the first step towards moving, taking action on that bill. Because there, 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 there weren't any personnel to do anything. There wasn't any funding to do anything. They just had this blueprint, but no one to do any of it. So now Brooke's going to start pushing that forward, which is great. Um, in terms of, like, specifically with pesticides, I think that the bill was a good first step in pulling um, some of the most harmful uh, pesticides, you know, nicotinoids off the shelves and make them less available for homeowner use. 
Um, they're still available for untreated seed articles, which is um, which is definitely an issue and might be coming up in this next legislative session, uh, which I've learned recently. Um, but we can talk about treated articles for a long time if you want. <laughs> Other opinions? Um, I, I will second what Samantha just said. That so the bill uh, makes it illegal to sell products uh, with that contain neonicotinoids that are destined for homeowner or backyard kind of uses, as opposed to. Um, or sorry, I think I think the way it, the bill reads is that you have to be a, a class A, a licensed mm -hmm. pesticide applicator to apply new nicotinoids, and that involves taking a course and then taking a three-hour exam with the state. Um, and most people who use pesticides are are um, backyard gardeners or something, and don't have don't have that training. Anyone who applies pesticides on the golf course or is a farmer or is a crop consultant is going to have this training. I have this training because I, I do some research with pesticides. Most people don't, and so the idea of the, that language in the bill was, we aren't going to see people buy the thing at Lowe's and then apply 10 times what they should in their backyard, which is, um, I guess, is, <coughs> is something that happens. If, people, if the label says use one teaspoon, but you have a really bad problem, maybe two teaspoons is better. Right? So, um, so that's positive, but to be honest, um, I actually think it's a largely symbolic um, victory for bees. I don't actually think it's going to do much of anything to help bees. And I'm sorry to say that. I'm enormously respectful of the people who worked on the bill and, and worked so hard to get it passed. Um, but the the uh, neonicotinoids that are that are not being applied because of this change represent a fraction of 1% of the total mass of neonicotinoids applied in Vermont each year. So if you accept that that is a problem, that neonicotinoids are a problem, you just like looked at this pie where there's this tiny, tiny little sliver, and then the whole rest of the pie is the other sliver, and you've taken out the tiny one. And so I mean, what does it really do? It, it, it can't be harming bees. It might actually not be helping them all that much. It makes us feel better. But I would submit that uh, there's a lot more heavy lifting to do, and not only with pesticides, but also with like climate change. I understand why you don't want to talk about it. It's just too much. Well, how do we get started helping bees by solving that problem? But that's next Tuesday. <laughs> that's next Tuesday. Yeah. So, so um, if you were to, you know, I've I've said that the vast majority of the, the neonics applied in Vermont aren't being removed from the shelf. So what could, if you think that's important, what could we do? Um, we can't really have a dairy industry in Vermont without those chemicals at this point. Like we could devolve the dairy industry into, into the thousands of small farms again, if we could, right? But we can't have dairy at the scale that we have it now without um, most of the producers using pesticides. And many of those people are struggling just to make a living anyway, right? And it really does come down to money for a, for a, a farmer. And so it's not so simple for the legislature to decide to outlaw new nicotinoids. Um, I would actually bet you that it's not possible in Vermont because we love agriculture so much. Um, and because farmers, because people will quickly see, we can't really have dairy as we know it without these chemicals. Um, Are, you, so, can yeah. I ask Are you talking specifically because of the treated seeds? Yeah. Okay. I should have said this. Um, so some, if, so the treated seeds, so corn is, is 99% of the corn that's grown everywhere is, is grown from these treated seeds. And so these neonicotinoids and chemicals are coated on the outside of these seeds. And when the seeds are planted, the chemicals are taken up in the plant systemically. And so if an herbivore eats the leaf, then that's how the insect will be affected by the neonicotinoid. But the issue is that these, these neonicotinoids, because they're systemic, they're also expressed in the pollen and the nectar of the plants. And so with, well, corn is not a good example, but in other plants, um, that's how pollinators can get um, exposed, just because they'll visit the flower and get exposed to these neonicotinoids, um, this is systemic pesticide. And so any seed that's, or any plant that's grown with these treated seeds is a really, is a prophylactic use of of pesticides, because you don't know whether you have the pest or not when you plant the seed. You don't have the pest when you plant the seed. 
Um, and so typically you should, through integrated pest management, show that you need to use a chemical because you have a pest before you use it, which is impossible with the treated seed model of, of growing things. And so because most corn is grown in treated seeds, that's the link to dairy. Sorry. Because yeah, dairy, because cows eat. <laughs> Neo, uh, so okay, so neonicotinoids <laughs> is it, people commonly say neonix, right? Neo, N-E-O, and then the word nicotine, that the alien, and then O-I-D-S, ne neonicotinoids. Uh, she's got it here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a spell check. With it's close enough. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question because it brings up an important point uh, about pesticide use and pesticides and bees and risk to bees. So neonicotinoids are um, a relatively new class of pesticides. They were invented in the 70s or 80s. They did not become commercially available until the 1990s. And their use very rapidly increased. And neonicotinoids largely replaced a bunch of other more toxic a bunch of other pesticides were more toxic to vertebrates and sometimes to plants. Right? Um, so they are safer, except unless if, uh, unless you're an insect, and then they're a lot less safe, or they're they're equal with what came before. So what I wanted to say is that there are four or five different neonicotinoids and and many different products that contain those four or five chemicals um, that are used in Vermont um, on corn. It's one or two of the five, um, but when we think about banning something, we should think about the consequences mm -hmm. and the unintended consequences. And so um, I, I hear constantly from people who want to ban neonicotinoids, and I don't think it's a bad idea necessarily, but I'm, I'm not sure it's going to accomplish the goal that the person has. And the reason is um, most farmers use pesticides, and most farmers who have that tool taken away from them are going to use this tool. And those of you who are beekeepers know a lot about this, right? But the scramble to try to use amitraz and then to use formic acid and, and thymol, and all these things to treat against mites. We keep trying different things because we, we lose the efficacy or we lose the, the legality in some cases. So my point is, um, neonics are a problem for bees, um, but we're not sure how big a problem, and we're not sure how big a problem here and taking them away could lead to something that's worse for these. So I, I think we need to think long and hard about uh, unintended consequences with legislating around pesticides. Thank you. I'm gonna lay out a, a few ground rules for their, our Q&A. Um, but first, Andrea, I want to give you a chance to remark on the legislation. Sure. Um, sure. So um, I totally appreciate what you. I'm Andrew Sander. I've worked with Rural Vermont. We were part of a large coalition of groups that worked on passing H uh, five, which uh, became the so-called Pollinator Protection Bill. A lot of people didn't know that part of what the bill was that it gave us some additional staff at the Agency of Agriculture to include in work another staff person, which were desperately needed to support the beekeepers and and you know get some more data that would help us understand what's going on with the bees. Um, the coalition of groups that worked on this bill understood from the beginning that it was a tiny, tiny step. But what it did is it broke a five, seven year logjam in the legislature, where every year for the last five or seven years, bills had been introduced and, and just not, not gone anywhere. So, Fortunately, Chip Troiano was the lead sponsor of the bill, who did a lot of work to get a lot of legislators on board with it. The other thing that happened that I think was really valuable was we educated a lot of people by virtue of people coming and testifying. Samantha came and testified. A lot of people from the Beekeepers Association came and testified. So there's a whole bunch of legislators up at the State House now who understand a lot more about what's going on with bees and what all these interacting factors are. Um, rural Vermont is particularly, and, and the rest of the coalition members are particularly concerned about unintended consequences and also the feasibility of removing certain tools from the toolbox that are considered to be dangerous. But it has been done in other places. Canada has a program where farmers have to show that they have the pest problem that is addressed by 
by the chemicals that are on the treated seeds before they can use the treated seeds. We don't have that requirement here. And in fact, the pest that is most generally treated by the neonicotinoids, it doesn't, isn't very common anymore. It doesn't crop up very often. So there is this enormous overuse of a pesticide that's not really treating a particular pest. It's just getting into the environment systemically. So um, we recognize that any kind of change in the use of these treated seeds would have to be done in a phased way that provided farmers with alternatives, in particular, non-treated seeds or seeds that are not treated with this particular pesticide. Um, so um, the coalition is continuing to work on this. Um, there is a bill that will be introduced this year that will work on phasing out treated seeds. Um, there's probably a lot of work that's going to have to happen there, but I would encourage everyone here, if you care about this issue, start talking to your elected representatives. Let them know that you have this concern and that you want them to continue to do this work. Um, there's likely to be another bill that would be a more global bill looking at the Vermont Pesticide Advisory Council created about 20 years ago with a specific mandate to guide the state toward a reduction in the use of pesticide, number of acres, and number of all of that. And they have not done that. And largely they have not done that because they have no teeth. I mean, the, the body as it was created was not given any power to speak of other than making recommendations. And it hasn't been used as a tool to move the state in that direction. So look for those pieces of legislation um, there will be more information coming out. But the first thing you can do right away is corner your legislator and say, this is an important issue. I want you to pay attention to it. I want you to work on it. Thanks for the soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just a, a couple of ground rules, really norms for our Q&A. We have uh, just under a half an hour here. Um, please introduce yourself. Uh, keep your question uh, concise as possible. I know often framing and context is required, but let's, let's keep a uh, mind on the time. Direct your question, please, um, if it's for an individual panelist or for the whole panel. And then, just in an effort to try to encourage as much participation as possible, we'll try the the old three before me rule. You ever heard of the three before me? Oh yeah, I was, at, I was there. That was good. <laughs> so, you know, ask a question, and then I'm sure you have another question. I have like, 275. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I ask one, and then I wait for two or three plus questions before I ask my next question. All right, and I'll, I'll, I'll point at people as you have questions. Yes? Hi there, my name is Harry Khan, part of the team at Caledonian Spirits. Um, maybe it's a question for a lead person that up. How should we think about the, um, the relative impact on the bees across those four? influences that we talked about, climate change, mites, pesticides, and habitat loss. Is there one that's really sort of in the lead in terms of being the villain here, or we're not really sure? Can you talk a little bit about how we should think about this problem? We have to prioritize. Sure. Um, well, I don't, I don't know if any one problem is more, causing more of a problem more than the others. Um, I can say that we know that there's, in, in, Part of the problem is that there's synergistic effects between all of these interacting threats. These threats are all interacting. So um, if a bee's not getting the proper nutrition it needs because there's not enough flowers, it's going to do worse when it gets introduced to a pathogen, for example. Or if it gets challenged with a pesticide at the same time it's not getting enough food, or, you know, you think about when you run your body down because you've been working late at night pulling a couple of nighters and not eating properly, you know, same kind of, same kind of idea. Um, so there's that which kind of complicates things. But I do like the idea of sort of maybe in my mind, I've, I've been sort of trying to prioritize the threats and figuring out which ones I want to work on first um, in my own research. And um, I, you know, I know I have friends who are working on other problems first. Um, and so think about where you can make the biggest difference in your own world. Um, climate change is a big one, of course, but we can all do things related to that. If you're a beekeeper, or if you, so this is something, I'll get up on my soapbox here for a second. I get a lot of people who are interested in saving the bees, because uh, saving the bees and so they become a beekeeper. 
and as leaf, it will, they'll say, oh, I'm really interested in becoming a beekeeper and do something about the bees. I think it's important to have more bees around. Um, and as Leif mentioned earlier, honeybees are an agricultural livestock animal. So I equate it to saying you want to do something about you know, bird conservation, and so you become a chicken farmer. It's sort of like, it's not the same thing. Um, it's great if you want to be a beekeeper, uh, but you're not, by becoming a beekeeper, you're not saving the bees. Um, by becoming a beekeeper, you could actually be causing more of a problem if you're not educated, or educating yourself and taking care of your bees properly. You could be, as you heard earlier, spreading disease to other beekeepers or to the wild bees. Um, so that's something to think about when you think about how you can change things in your own world. If you want to be a beekeeper, great, but spend some time getting educated first. <laughs> I'll add two things. One is, yes, take Samantha's class. If you want to be a <laughs> and the second one um, is, I think it depends on which bee we're talking about. And so so um, honeybees have the varroa mite to deal with. And as Samantha said er earlier, the varroa mite does not attack any of those other native bees. So that is not a threat to them, categorically just not. And, unless you think of the indirect threat where they spread disease to honeybees and honeybees spread disease to, to the native bees. Right. So it depends on which, which bee we're thinking about. Um, and I would, I would just underscore that the synergistic effects uh, are really uh, turning out to be where the, where the interesting story is in many cases. Like if, uh, the effect of a neonicotinoid at a certain dose on a bee, we can, we can characterize that. But then if you add um, a gut parasite, it's so much worse. Or a fungicide. It's, or a fungicide. And so I, I, was, I also wanted to just put in your head that we're not usually talking about one pesticide at a time. These are exposed to, um, in, in studies of honeybee collective pollen, we're seeing um, uh, on average, I think, uh, this is generally speaking, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but maybe 30 to 40 different types of pesticides as residues in the pollen that's from, from the bee. A single pollen. A single bee. That's what she found in, in the world when she went out to get food. So some of those, they don't interact with each other, but some of them really do. And so, so some of the biggest problems with pesticides are not the one thing you can name, like neonicotinoids. They're these complex mixtures. Um, and just one quick anecdote, in almonds, there's this emerging story where um, it's a very intensively farmed crop. We have to bring honeybees to it if we want almonds at all. So more than half of US honeybees go out to California for six weeks or less uh, each year just to pollinate almonds. Lots of pesticides applied during the bloom. Um, there are these adjuvants that are um, added to the product to make them stick to leaves better, to make them uh, make the droplets get smaller or larger, depending on the, what you need. Some of the adjuvants themselves, so these are other chemicals that are not regulated and they're not pesticides per se. They're, um, they're like organosilicone, assumes, but they're industrial chemicals. Well, those are toxic by themselves, and some of those potentiate the pesticide and make it more toxic. So um, when you, when we talk about these risks, I think we have to kind of define the terms a little bit. And it's a very complex thing. And in most cases, we can't tell you which is the worst stressor. It's, it's kind of like it's everything. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Um, the word climate change seems to be a big umbrella word. And I'm wondering if you can say exactly what is the mechanism of climate change that's affecting the problem. Um, yeah, I've done some research on this. Uh, so uh, we took, I was talking about dead bees on pins, and we, we used that data to look at where bees occurred uh, before climate change really took off. And then we used more recent data to look at where bees now occur. And what we've seen uh, on two continents, for about 65 bee species, is this, this coherent pattern where they are, um, for bumblebees, they are uh, dying out at the southern margins of their ranges where conditions are hottest. So a bee might occur from Georgia to Vermont, let's say. The populations in Georgia are blinking out because it's just too hot now. The ones in Vermont are still fine, right? Same species. But um, the ones in Vermont are not moving northward, tracking the warming. And we see this with plants and butterflies and many other taxa. Bumblebees, for some reason, you have a northern limit and a southern limit, and it's the southern limit moving northward, but the northern limit is stuck. And then they're also moving up in elevation. So the net, well, the net uh, result is a loss of, loss of their plumage. 
So um, we, there's a lot more to say about how climate change affects bees, a lot of it on a single generation kind of micro site level. But um, these are just like the, the, the early warning signs of what climate change is doing to species distributions. And um, I think you're going to see a lot more about that <coughs> uh, with respect to bees. Normally, when something in nature you know, gets wiped out, something else takes its place. Do you think that will happen with pollinators, or do you, is there any evidence towards that? Like when you go out into the Champlain Valley ag country, are you seeing like maybe there's less bumblebees, or but there's more, you know, alfalfa leaf cutters or something that are going to take their place? I think you're seeing a simplification species compositions. So we're losing, well you did this research, but <laughs> we see declines in about half of the bumblebee species, but some species are actually doing better. Um, so, so some of the more common general species are actually doing better. So we're seeing like an oversimplification of the system, um, which could be an issue if there are specific bees that pollinate specific plants, then we're losing those um, connections, right? The wild plants that need a specific pollinator to kind uh, to pollinate that plant. So, oversimplification, and there are consequences. So, uh, the um, book to my question is still the same word, and the original question I had was uh, when you went to uh, like do your uh, study on the bees of New England with, with the group you did it with. Um, do you know if anybody assessed the rodents in Cape Cod at the time? Because it seemed to me like it was pretty recent, like within the last two years. Um, explain what you mean about rodents, why, why they're important. Uh, because uh, recently in, in Nantucket, uh, this study was uh, introduced after an experiment uh, done on, on the artificial selection of mice in order to uh, counteract the uh, diseases that uh, ticks and uh, closely related mites uh, carry uh, by finding a, I think it's a pathogen in, uh, in one of those um, ticks and, or actually multiple, uh, they started with the ticks and then uh, once they saw that it was working on the mites, they uh, introduced it to the squirrels in the area, and then they were going to do it on mice so that they could they could um, help uh, eradicate Lyme disease. But first, they had to uh, assess the damage done by uh, the pathogen, the pathogen that was going into the recessed uh, members of the uh, the tribe that exponentially multiplied. Multiplied. What's the connection to bees? Like, I, think I see one, but I'm because uh, the, the damage uh, may have been done on bees, but they, they don't know. Oh, by by genetic modification of the animals. Or? Uh, I'm not sure. It, yeah, by the genetic modification. Yeah. I can't. I don't really know anything about the system you're talking about. Um, I'll just say briefly that uh, genetically modified crops. So far, are not a problem for bees. We don't know of any any issues like that. But um, you raised the question of rodents, and for one type of bees, the bumblebees, um, rodents are really important because they can't dig their own underground nests, and they need an existing hole in the ground. So they go searching in the springtime, looking for nest sites, and they fight over them. Sometimes they kill each other over the best nest site. And the best nest sites are often chipmunk burrows and uh, white-footed deer mouse burrows. So it, there's been a lot of speculation. It actually goes all the way back to when Darwin wrote about bees um, um, 160 or 70 years ago or something like that, that, that uh, if you have a lot of predators, you have fewer rodents and you have fewer bees. And, and we don't really know just how strong the links are, but it, it seems like there is some link between rodents and bees. Wow. Yeah. That's really good. I didn't know that. Other questions? Jody Kelly, I'm just interested, Bar Hill, um, are you looking to 
use something other than honey in the future if that becomes a, a major issue? Um, we've made spears with burdock root from the Cade Farm in Plainfield. Um, we're doing trials with elderberries. We used to make elderberry cordial. Um, we're open to the fruit of the um, Vermont agricultural landscape. Distilling has a long history in farming, and um, we're doing trials to use local agricultural products and um, bring these to the marketplace. We have um, a room full of whiskey that's maturing, all made with um, winter rye and barley. There's no honey in that. And hopefully that will be released next year. Whatever is local and people want, we are open to doing. Brooke, I wonder if you could say anything about the process the agency is going through to implement the new law. As minor as it is, one of the pieces of it is, as I understand it, um, the pesticide, the annual pesticide registrations are timing out. And so the process of getting the, the neonicotinoids off the shelves is now beginning because they're not going to renew registrations for these kinds of products. Is there anything that you could talk about that the agency is doing to get the word out about that or that people here can do in interacting with their local stores? Like for instance, we heard testimony last session that Oshans right here in Montpelier was already taking those things off the shelves, mostly because they were getting pressure from their customers. People saying, why are you still selling this? This is bad, don't have it. And um, other stores, some of the bigger stores, are starting to take them out. But can you say anything about what's happening with the agency or what people can do to assist? Yeah, we do have a field inspector who his job is to go around and look at stores, look on the shelves, and make sure that there are no neonics on the shelves. So if you are out in the store and want to walk down the pesticide aisle and read some labels, you can definitely do that and call the Agency of Agriculture and you know just make a report and we can uh, send somebody out to, to check it out and probably find the people for breaking the law. Can they still be selling and sold? Um, I think it should, it's supposed to be off the shelf, off the shelf. period, yeah. And, and the label isn't going to say neonicotinoid, it's going to say imidacloprid or clothian. Yeah. <laughs> So study up on those words. <laughs> We're kind of putting a cheat sheet put in your wallet. <laughs> and I think there are some exceptions too. I think there's some like fatty spray yeah, that's legal. So it's like that products so that you would be spraying right outdoors mm -hmm. yeah. that are illegal. I'm not the moderator. I shouldn't be. Yeah. 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 It, it's not widely known that. Um, the, the oral flea and tick medications you give your pets are neonicotinoids. Yeah. And so I think fipronil is the, is the compound that's usually used in those veterinary medications. And so when we think about the, the total mass that we apply to the ground, you know, we actually apply a lot of, the, of neonicotinoids via dog food. Um, and I'm not advocating that we that we ban those products and let our dogs get fleas and ticks, but I am advocating that we think deeply about you know, your impacts are and what it really means to say, this is bad, we should do something about it. Um, a lot of it is getting into the environment through our love of dogs and cats. My, my yeah. um, I came to realize that basically we're a country addicted to drugs. It's just swept under the carpet. A drug is anything that increases immediate and medium pleasure and loss long term. Our whole agricultural system pretty much is conventional chemical farming. Miticides, pesticides, fertilizers, bactericides, fungicides, viricides. Organic gets a lot of press in Vermont, as it should, but it's a single digit percent of the agriculture in Vermont. We are a country addicted to drugs, and I think we just have to really face that we talk about opioids, and they're terrible. We talk about heroin. 
the overuse of those, and they kill people. And these chemical agricultural products are killing people. They're shortening our lives, they're causing allergies, they're causing cancer. We have to just come to grips across our country that we are addicted to drugs, and it's called our food system. And this is the expense of what we like to think of as cheap food. It's a great loss in our health, as well as a loss in the soil health. And here we're talking about the health of the bees. And until we really face that, which is kind of like what we're sweeping under the carpet, I don't think we're going to get as far as we need to, as quickly as we need to. Don't sweep that into the mycelium. I would add, too, just on to what, what else the agency is doing. Um, so if you ever are walking around or um, you know walking through the city and you suspect a pesticide kill, if there's a fruiting or flowering tree and you see a bunch of dead bees under it, that's an illegal use of a pesticide. They're not really supposed to spray. Even if they're licensed, they should, not, they should know better. <laughs> pesticide applicators aren't supposed to spray when uh, plants are flowering. So if you suspect something, call the Agency of Agriculture. You can find my information on the website, too. So you can send somebody out to investigate as well. Can I just tag on that one quickly thing that I just heard and the feedback meeting was that neonicotinoids were identified as a possible for possible use against the emerald ash borer. And a lot of people have jumped on that and are hiring licensed applicators to inject ash trees that they're trying to save with neonicotinoids. But there's some new research indicate that that just is not an effective treatment. But because neonicotinoids are systemic, if they are injected into the tree, they become part of the tree, they get into the soil, and so on. And so if you're a landowner and you're dealing with ash trees, and somebody says to you, let's use the anicotinoids, question that, because it's probably not an effective way to do it. And it is another overuse of, of these chemicals that we really don't need any more of in the environment. Yeah, well, I was just wondering, is there any mechanism for betting that the studies going right now to try to prove that the neonics is a problem and in places where they have banned it, like France I guess banned it a few years back. I don't know if it was on all crops, I know it was on sunflowers. Have they shown that it, 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 you know, that it was a problem or is it still a problem? 
So this is a, a really interesting question. Um, neonicotinoids were banned across the board in France and then in Germany and then in all of the EU um, over the last 10 years, right? So we actually have this cool natural experiment. If, yeah. if people are right that neonicotinoid, neonicotinoids are part of the problem for honeybees and for native bees, um, we could ask that before and after question in Europe, right? And I don't know enough about it to really fully answer your question. I do know um, neonics like clothianidin are still turning up in honeybee collective pollen five years later. So people are still using them, but not very often. So they have they have a stockpile, or they got it illicitly, or something. Or is it that persistent? Is it last no. no, it is persistent, but on the order of months to up to maybe two two years is, is like a half life for a neonic. That's a lot, and it, and it can build up in soil. The, the the thing I just described would be from somebody using it this year, right? Um, I I can tell you that there are ongoing bee losses in Europe, even though they're no longer being affected by neonics for, for the most part. So maybe that wasn't the number one problem. I, I don't. I, I really don't know. Um, but but it's a great question, and like there's an amazing opportunity to actually study that in Ontario and in, in uh, the EU. And I, I hope people are able to. All right, <clears throat> folks. I want to respect the time here and um, make a few announcements. And first off, though. Um, Thank this panel. So Jody is, is not kicking us out of here. There's food to be eaten, there's, there's bee products from Todd over on the side, and I'm sure there's questions and conversation that's going to go around. Yeah. But I, I do want to point out and remind folks, next Tuesday, right here, same time, same place, the panel is uh, climate change and food security. I'm sure we're going to be coming back to some similar things, but then blowing it open a bit. Then on December 14th, there's a craft fair with workshops from 9 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon. If you go to the Garage Cultural Center website and Facebook page, you'll see more information there. And you'll also have an opportunity to sign up for some of the workshops to see the offerings. Um, Thank you very much for coming out on a Tuesday night and sign the book right over here. If you'd like to get on the, the mailing list for the Garage Cultural Center or for the CSS, that's a nonprofit based out of the high school, and we're definitely trying to do more of these community events like we're doing this December. Um, and we're also teaming up with Catherine to help bring Bill McKibben back to town on March 31st, right at Montpelier High School Auditorium. So, um, thanks again.